Good evening, and welcome to a special Black History Month edition of The Daily Drum. I'm Harold Fisher. Tonight, we shine a spotlight on Black women who are shattering the glass ceiling, pushing the limits and erasing stereotypes. These women are making moves and charting their own her story. But even as they celebrate their accomplishments and watch with awe the historic election of Kamala Harris, Black women and girls know the fight for equality is far from over. My guests tonight confirm the struggle is still very real, but so is the success. From political and business movers and shakers to sports and science icons, these boss ladies are here to share their stories and life lessons they're passing on to others. Let's begin with our first panel. Izine Okoru, board member of She's the First, Michelle Davis Younger, mayor of the city of Manassas, Virginia, Tiffany Capri Hainsworth, CEO and owner of T Capri Tequila. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. Um, I, I want to I want to first start with with you uh, as an A, because you you were the former first head of inclusion and diversity for H and M. You're also a Harvard University graduate. What does it mean? to be first? You know, I think for me, thinking about the first, um, and as much as I'm celebratory of that, I know that it comes with a lot of responsibility. And I and I honor that, and I and I hold on to that, and really realizing that I'm representing many women um, from across the world that look like me, and and always wonder how we get there. But for me, being the first means I think Kamala Harris said perfectly is not being the last, and that's really my goal, and that's how I strive is to making sure that I'm using, utilizing my platform to advocate for other women um, to kind of lift as we climb, and and that's really what my um, background and my mission is always is because I know that together we are stronger and that um, we want to make sure that we kind of stop this first, right? I, I want to be the last first and I want to make sure that this is a normal thing for the world to see women, Black women, women of color in very senior roles. Um, and it's often only at the top, but I know that we're making a lot of progress. Um, Madam Mayor, I was asking you, um, when you were a candidate, was there a consideration in your mind about breaking the glass ceiling, or, or was that an issue for you at all when you were running? Absolutely. When I ran in 18, I was an elected. I was the first woman of color to ever get elected to the Manassas City Council. So being on council for two years, and getting on there and seeing that, hey, there's still a whole lot of work to be done. Um, that's what catapulted me in, into running for mayor and realizing that I had the momentum behind me already and everyone already pushing for that to see this change. Didn't dawn on me that it was gonna be a trifecta, first woman, first person of color, and first Democrat to ever hold the seat as mayor in the city of Manassas. Knowing all of that, and a presidential election full steam ahead. I did realize it and move forward with that in my mind the entire time, so absolutely. But in moving forward with that, uh, did the honeymoon period wear off rather quickly because there was work to do? Absolutely, and it, and it wore off even more quickly than I wanted because there was no transition from the former uh, mayor there. So I pretty much walked into the seat um, with no, here's what I'm working on, here's what you need to catch up with, here's what I'm doing. It was just full steam ahead from day one. I, I was ready to move forward, but a lot of folks wanted to sit and bask in the glory of, we won, we did it, we're here. And I'm saying, we got work to do, just like you said. And it was a lot to get me here, but you all have to help me stay here and make sure that I'm successful in this role, being the first. Like she said, it's a lot of um, a lot of weight on your shoulders, but when you have the support and people showing up to help you, it can work. But definitely lots of work to do, lots of minds to be changed, lots of that to do. So, Tiffany, you are in, like many of the women that we're talking to in this program, a very, very unique position. You're the CEO and you're the owner of a branded spirits company, specifically tequila. 
tea yes. uh, tequila. Why tequila, first of all? <laughs> I love tequila. Who doesn't love tequila? Uh, I, yeah, Why I, I not? Honestly, uh, yeah, okay, there you go. Um, <laughs> hmm. So, <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm I'm like, guy, but that's, that's an easy different. question. <laughs> I guess like I'm a brown liquor guy, but that's a different question. Hey, we have a reposado and an anejo. Oh, okay. Brown. Okay, you're going to have to explain that to me and, and and to our listeners as well who are who are not you know part of you know the uh, the tequila lovers club. But yeah. it, all, all jokes aside, you are in an industry that is male dominated, yeah. not a lot of people of color, and virtually no women at all. How do you compete and how have you been received? Wow. Um, when I first ventured to Jalisco, I was actually received with welcome, welcoming arms. Um, the people are wonderful. They're amazing. They're um they're they're affectionate and they're caring people. So when I told them that I really wanted to learn how to make tequila and, you know, go to the agave fields. And I was excited about that. It was, they were amazing. They were amazing at helping me. Um, I didn't realize at the time that, you know, and I didn't go into it knowing that I was going to be the first African-American woman to solely own a tequila brand. I went into it because I didn't want to just put my name on a, a bottle and just not, you know, um, be involved in the process. I wanted to be really in depthly involved in the process. And um, it, it was, it, it took a lot of work. It took a lot of work from getting all of my licensing myself to um, going back and forth to Jalisco, Mexico from 2000. 18 to learning from farm to glass um pr the process of how you make tequila and um i i love it i i love being in it solely being the distributor the importer the owner right now i love everything about it what kind of challenges have you faced though in the industry i've faced challenges as far as um, going in as a sales representative so once my tequila's gotten on the ground, um, it was like, okay, yeah, we'll talk to your distributor. And I'm like, you're looking at her. And so, you know, they're like, oh, you own the brand and you distribute the brand? Yeah, so like, let's have a conversation. Um, I've had a lot of those challenges with, you know, liquor store owners because they're so acclimated to dealing with men and um, they didn't really want to deal with me in that way. I didn't, and then the other challenges I had, of course, was due to COVID. Like my tequila was supposed to be here uh, last year, but due to COVID, the processing time, a lot of the um, distilleries and the bottling companies, they were only functioning at 50%. So they weren't making bottles and they weren't making tops and the hemidors weren't farming the agave field. So that was really hard for me to get that kicked in. Mm, that, that's amazing just to hear you you, you talk about that. Uh, I, I want to go back to, uh, you know, as an A, because this organization that you are part of, She's the First, deals with girls specifically. Talk to me about the kind of, of thing that you are trying to impart to these women in training for for back, lack of a better term and, and what part does being the first play in what you're sharing with them yeah you know i if i go back to my younger years as well too i am from nigeria i came to the united states when i was seven years old and i know what my culture says and and um, unfortunately oftentimes in these third world countries young girls are kind of um boxed into what the gender norms are and their responsibility. So education after probably high school is not a priority. Um, so when I discovered she's the first and I connected with them, I was thinking to myself, this is a great opportunity to be able to give back. And that I was fortunate enough and I have the privilege to be in a family where 
it was all about education. It was all about advancing your career and advancing your goals. Um, and I wasn't subject to getting married or forced to getting married at a super young age. So as She's the First, what we do is that we are creating programming and partnerships and opportunities for young girls ages 11 to 17 to, so that they can become the first in their households, in their communities, in their um, countries to excel and whatever definition of excel is for them. So that can be the first to go to college. It can be the first to go to high school. It can be the first to have an advanced degree. It can be the first to work outside of the home. And I think that what we wanna do is normalize those conversations more so that women are not boxed into these roles of what society says that they think that they are. You know, if we look at the growing numbers of, of CEOs that are women in um, Fortune 500, you know, the, the numbers are growing, but still there's so much opportunity because there's only one black female CEO. And to me, that's alarming when you think about we're in 2021. And so I think, but the important thing is that we continue to strive and we continue to lift as we climb. I mean, I think that's the best that we can do and be um, role models for the young girls that are watching us. And that's what She's the First is all about. Is it hard to motivate them? You know, I say that the the youth are like, they're the fire. <laughs> they motivate me. <laughs> I'm hungry. Right. They motivate me to do more, to push more, to believe in more. They're fearless. And if I can, if I can put my corporate hat on, um, in the organizations that I have been a part of, they're the ones advocating for no nonsense change. They will not tolerate the lack of accountability or transparency. They're the leading voices when it comes to inclusion, diversity, and equity, climate, um, climate change, uh, equity amongst non-binary and transgender communities and LGBTQ. It is the youth that are that are pushing that forward. So I think the future is bright, but I think we need to make sure that we continue to motivate them and we continue to use social media for good. So of course, you know, you know, they also want to be kids, but I think we need to kind of show them that there's so much bigger out there in the world. And I think that they're getting that because they motivate me. Hmm. Mary Younger, because you are the first in, in your position. Who is your role model? Who is your Black woman motivator? Well, of course, you, Michelle Obama being the first first lady um, set, the, set the bar. Um, I, I often go back to my parents and what they persevered, only because of the, you have to kind of understand the history of Manassas being the city that it is and what they had to go through and how they endured. They saw the nasty, the segregation, the discrimination, but they hung in there. And 50 years later, their daughter is now the mayor. Places where they couldn't walk in and sit down and have a meal. They couldn't go in the front door. They had to go outside. They have food poked out through a hole. Their daughter is now the mayor. So me looking up to my mom who had to literally scrub the floors a mile in the houses that are a mile away from where City Hall is, where I sit every day. She definitely was someone that I looked up to, to, to live through that, to put up with that and stay here and never realizing that this, that your child would make the change that needed to happen in the very city where you were discriminated against. That is someone that I look up to as my mom, but but absolutely Michelle Obama and, and how you have to persevere when people say all kinds of things about you. They don't know you and you just keep your head up and you know that you've been called to do something, you do it, and, you, and, you, and you're called, you're, you walk in your purpose, you know it, you feel it. Um, and she was just always positive no matter what, and that's what I try to do. Is it an issue for you, though? I mean, you, you said something that I thought was, was interesting. People are going to say all kinds of things about you. And, and, and yeah. if I may, you have to put on the, the full armor of God to <laughs> yeah. against that. But are you concerned about stereotypes, for example, Black female stereotypes? And how have you dealt with that? if it's been an issue for you it, as mayor? It, it has not reared its ugly head too much yet. I've got three years to go, <laughs> I just got in the seat, but it is looking at everything that I do is way, you know, scrutinized a lot more closely. What is she gonna change now? Oh, she's buying this, oh, she's doing this. It is, it is difficult to not 
become that stereotypical bitter black woman where your neck is none of that. I make sure that I don't do any of that because they're looking for it. And when I am addressing everyone, it is the same. I am speaking with the same tone and manner as everyone. I have a city to run and you can get on board with me or just stand aside, but I've got work to do. You can join me or not, but, but I'm going to be the same when you see me every time. It's, my conversation is going to be the same. It is very difficult because there is that, what is, is she really like that? I've heard she's nice, but is she really like that? When are we going to see that fierce black woman come out? Mm-hmm. And they're looking for it. And sometimes they'll try to provoke you to make you go there, but I purposely am aware and do not do that mm-hmm. because I know they're looking for it. Um, it's difficult because I always have that little bit of conversation going in the back of my mind. You got to watch it. You got to watch Whether people don't have to think about that. Wow. Yeah. I, I do. And uh, it, it's a struggle. T- Tiffany, you're nodding your head. Is something you want to add to that? Yeah, because it's like when I'm going into um, retailers or liquor stores and I'm dealing with the males in the liquor industry, if it's either one way or the other, it's a double-edged sword. Like you can't be too soft and too meek, but if you get aggressive with them to let them know, like, you can't play with me and I'm serious, this is this is my business, then you're labeled as, oh, she's difficult or she's an angry black woman or, you know, she has this stigma on her. So it's like you find a bal- you have to find a balance to work with in this industry, a male dominated industry. As a female, you have to m- make them understand to, they're going to respect me. You know, you have to right. treat them how to treat you. And yeah. you're not going to walk all over me because I'm a female, I'm a black female woman in this yeah. industry. And I'm not going to be so aggressive as to you're going to smear my name, you know, in the industry. So yeah. it is, it's a, it's a fine, it's, it's a fine, yeah. fine line <laughs> with that <laughs> remaining a, a balance as a black woman. Cause we're, we have so many labels. Yeah. yeah. Indeed. Yeah. As in the, you're in an interesting position on this particular topic because you're in the you're you're in the process of teaching girls how to be uh, good women, and I'll just use good as the umbrella to mm-hmm. to be inclusive of everything. Mm-hmm. When we have reality TV and all of these other kinds of oh, yeah. uh, that do not portray black women in the best light. Absolutely. Guilty pleasure or not. <laughs> you yeah. know, what, yeah. what kind of conversations do you have with the girls about this? Yeah, though I think I think a lot of what Tiffany was saying too and what the mayor was saying, I think is it's finding the balance of you I, me, I never want to censor anyone, right? You have the ability and the um to, to explore. So you should explore. But I think it is oftentimes is really leading by example. A lot of things with these younger kids too, they don't want to be told what to do, right? Mm-hmm. They want you to walk that walk mm-hmm. and show them that you can be successful, beautiful, sexy, smart, you know, and you don't have to degrade yourself for certain things. And and really distinguishing the, the, the fact that what is truly reality, like in real life, I see you, you see me, and what is reality TV. And, and and I think that that's really why it's critical. I think we're starting to see a lot of information now about um, policies and privacy laws, in social, especially in social media. And it's because of that, I think we have a responsibility to keep safe spaces, regardless of what the larger world wants to do, or actually it's really just a small subset. It just feels like it's everyone, but it's really just a small subset that we have to keep showing them uh, what being a role model looks like and what it and and that you can have all these things in the right way. Um, so yeah, it, I, I did want to also ask you uh, as an A, you went to Howard University and certainly great education, but what role did the university, in your opinion, play in you? getting a firm foundation of self that you've now taken it with you to to be a a glass ceiling breaker yeah you know it's it's funny because at at work i you know every time they talk about hbcus historically black colleges and universities and howard university specifically and i tell everybody i'm like welcome to the world like this is who Howard breathes. And then, you know, I'm wearing my Bison like Kamala shirt today because I think it's really proving that 
Howard University and other HBCUs as well are truly grooming the finest and most brilliant and the trailblazers in various industries. Just the room that we are in represented now. I mean, we're women from all kinds of life in, in different businesses and we're excelling. You know, I think my particular experience at Howard was one where, at, you know, at, at, as the Mecca, I felt like I was in a global org global institution because you had people coming from all over the entire world, including international students. And I think sometimes people fail to remember that and to think about the intersectionality that happens even amongst the Black community. Um, so I, I credit a lot of my network uh, my ability to show up and to deliver with that, not only the confidence, but also with the competence um, from going to Howard. You know, a lot of it, and I'm also a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, Alpha Chapter, and I think that that also groomed that too. You know, so I, I, I understand the privileges that I have, and that's why she's the first, and even my role in diversity and inclusion, I'm so passionate about it because I have to give back to those that have fed into me. Mm, okay, now, 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 it, now it makes sense. She's a dog. Okay, <laughs> no, no, no shade to the other, uh, the other party. So, you know, we're we're all on the same team. Tiffany, yes, the you have established yourself, uh, at least from the outside, rather quickly. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, for for those who have just all of a sudden discovered there's a black woman who is now. You know, running a a major liquor company, specifically. Uh, so solely, solely running. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I don't have any partners. And, and that's wow. what I mean. And so now, how do you deal with other young women coming to you looking for advice? Was that something that that you're that is happening? Have you been ready for it? Um, how do you how do you address the this instant notoriety? Um, when women ask me for advice, the best thing I tell them, and I have um, sent a couple of messages to women that were saying they wanted to start a wine business or a bourbon business, and my my main thing is to focus. You have to have the passion, you have to focus, and you have to do the research because I can't guide you through every single process. You have to research in depthly what you want and you have to master your, your craft. You have to master it. You can't just jump in. Like I couldn't just jump into the tequila industry. It was no way in the world. I literally had to go when people told me not to go. I went to Guadalajara by myself. I went to Jalisco. Every trip to Mexico I went to, I went by myself. I was determined. So, you know, I, I definitely push research. I'm a big reader. I will, I mean, Google is everybody's friend right now. Research everything you want to do. Research it down to the distillery, down to the industry, down to how it started, when it started. You have to research. And I, I love the fact that women will inbox me and say, I, I let my daughter read your story because I saw you delivering your product. So you don't just see me glammed up or on TV or whatever. You're going to see me in the fields in Mexico. You're going to see me getting this dolly out of my truck and delivering these cases. I'm all in. And you have to be all in. You can't just want it just to say, oh, I own a liquor brand. If that's yeah. all you want, then... It you that's you're not in it because it's your passion. You're in it because it's just something to do. But if it's your passion, you go all in everything. Mm -hmm. Well, you say you certainly are passionate about it, and <laughs> and for you know for any uh, culinary pursuit, whether it be food or you know spirits or, or wine. I mean, I, I think you really have to be because you have to look like you believe in it, you know, particularly with, you know, something that you got to taste. So you don't want to, mm. Exactly, exactly. And I, that's what I wanted. I wanted to change people's perspective about tequila. People always think, oh, I don't want to drink tequila. They think about the college days where you're just taking shots, but it's, you're drinking the wrong tequila. <laughs> I'm trying to show you. There's a really phenomenal tequila out here. It's mine. I love mine, of course. <laughs> Of course, yeah. and I, mean, I, know, I don't know where you went to school. I didn't do any of that. 
I, I, I actually had a question too for Tiffany. I'm wondering when you were going to Mexico, did you have to speak the local language? Like, how were you able to navigate? And there's a, a specific reason why I'm asking that question. The well, first, with me because I, I I only have a few minutes left, so please go right ahead. Quickly. Okay, the first three times I went. I did not speak the language and I relied on a sales representative for the company. And then when things didn't go right, I hired my own director of international affairs to come with me. Okay. So now I have my own translator. But for the first three trips, it was really shaky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, awesome. and I had my translator on my phone. So yes. <laughs> well, there you go. Modern technology. I, I as I said, I only have a a, a few minutes left, and I wanted uh, each of you, from your own perspective, what what advice would you give to uh, black women or girls when it comes to breaking the glass ceiling? As in, a quickly, I'll give you a minute. You first. Yeah, I, I'm going to actually just jump off of the question that I asked Tiffany, just so it can correlate. I think that the important thing is go ahead and just jump out there and try. And, and the reason why I asked Tiffany that is because oftentimes we have imposter syndrome and we're so worried about, are we doing it right? Is it the right time? Overly calculated. I am 100% guilty of it. And sometimes you just have to take that leap. So my advice to, to women is apply for that job, start that business, you know, go on that vacation. You don't have to wait for the perfect moment and the perfect situation to go ahead and start to move and progress. And remember the community that's behind you. You're not going to be able to do everything by yourself. So it's okay to reach out and ask for help. And again, I'm speaking directly from personal experience. Mm -hmm. Madam Mayor, quickly, your, your advice. Absolutely. Um, do not stop. Do not give up. Do not let your environment around you, if you know better, you will do better. And my thing is to always reach back, grab, bring young women into chambers to sit in my chair. If someone had done that when I was eight, I'd probably be president, but not forgetting what's behind, moving forward and doing what you're called to do. When God expands you, no one can reduce you. That's what I tell all my young ladies. And Tiffany, I'll let you have the final word in this segment. Uh, your, your best advice. Do not be afraid of the word no. You're going to hear no, you're going to hear no, and you're going to hear no, but it takes one yes. One yes will catapult you into a lifetime that you could never imagine. Don't give up. Amazing. I, I want to thank our first panel of Women Trailblazers for sharing your stories and your lessons and your good humor. <laughs> when we come back. I want to introduce you to yet another group of boss ladies making moves in sports and medicine. Stay with us. Her story, today's Black women shattering the glass ceiling on this Black History Month edition of The Daily Drum will continue in just a few seconds. In our next segment, we talk to women who are trailblazers in sports and medicine. Some are household names, while others are newcomers, but their impact will be felt for generations. Jackie Joyner Kersey, retired track and field Olympian. Dr. Namanji Bumpus, director of the Department of Pharmacology and Molecular Sciences at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Jaya Patillo, 12 year old viral track star from Beaumont, Texas. And Jennifer King, assistant coach for the Washington football team. So let me, let, let me start with you, Jackie. Um, it says, you know, retired uh, Olympian. But when you first popped up before the show, you, you haven't aged at all. Let me just go say that you're you're absolutely you you look the same as you were when you were were in the Olympics. Being a being a first for you, did you concentrate on that, or were you just just working on your craft? You know, that's not something I concentrated on. I just did something I love doing. And I did not know that I was good at what I was doing. But, you know, being able to see other women uh, gave me the inspiration to, you know, if I work hard, then maybe I can reach the goals that I had set for myself. Hmm. Um, so 
at, at some point though, it had to hit you that I have, you've done something that, that someone else had not done. Uh, when was that for you? When did it hit you? And what did that feel like? Well, I, well, being in a multi-event is uh, challenging as it is the heptathlon, the seven different uh, disciplines uh, and making, going to the Goodwill Games when I had the opportunity to be the first woman to score with 7,000 points because so many said that was impossible to do. But I never put limits to whatever I was trying to do. So I didn't say I wanted to do this, but then it was like, 7,000, you know, seven events, maybe I could score a thousand points in each event. But then when I started looking at the events and the times to get the points in some events, yes, I could score 1100 points. In some events, I'm not quite there. And I might only could get 700 points. So I had to find that balance and it became a challenge of uh, me challenging myself to do what others said that couldn't be done. But for me, not to let the noise of the outside stop me from achieving what we, my coaches and all of us, uh, I had put in the training to do. Mm -hmm. I, I want to talk to yet another Olympian, a junior Olympian, Jaya Patillo. She's 12 years old and amazing. Hey, Jaya, how are you? I'm good. How are you? This is, it certainly is an honor uh, to talk to you, young lady. Thank you. Uh, you have been clocked at 17 miles per hour in a full out sprint on a on a treadmill. Do you realize how big of a deal that is? Yes, I do now, for sure. Oh God. <laughs> but talk, talk to me about it uh, because you are you are destined to be the first in so many in so many ways. Um, how does it feel to to get all of this attention for your 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 athletic accomplishments at 12 years old? By the way, you just turned 12 in <laughs> December, right? So you're 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 12.2. <laughs> yes. I think that it's just really crazy and I really appreciate all of the support I've been getting. And I just would never have expected all of this to happen, or at least not now and not in the way that it did happen. That did happen. And I just um, I just appreciate everything. And I just can't believe that I'm even here. And I just, um, yeah, that's basically all I can say. <laughs> uh, you are special. And, and you come from great family stock. But as an athlete, do you realize how special you are or are you just about the business of being the best you can be? I'm definitely focused on being the best that I can be, but I know that this is something that I'm good at and something that I have a talent in. And I definitely just want to continue doing this and hopefully one day go to the 2024 Olympics. And that's my goal. And I'm already proud of what I have done, but um, I'm just excited to see where I'll go in the future. Jackie, what do you see when you look at this this shooting star? Oh, I see someone, uh, Jaya, with a lot, lot of confidence, uh, know where her blessings come from, a person that's committed, uh, uh, have direction, understand the hard work, and she has goals. And she said, Jaya said it best, you know, she wants to go to the Olympics. That was my goal. Didn't know if it was going to happen, but she's already on course to do whatever she sets her mind up to do. Yeah, that I, I want to stick with uh, with the sports theme here and and talk to Jennifer King. She is an assistant coach for the Washington football team. Yet, uh, you know, uh, another big deal. Home team. Um, I, I really, I, I would, I would just say, Jennifer, it's about time. Do you agree? Yeah, I totally agree. Um... You know, it's been a long time coming for me personally and, and also just for women in football. But, um, you know, it's definitely about time. Talk to, talk to us a little bit about your, your specific coaching duties for those who um, are not paying attention to what's happening on the sidelines and only pay atten paying attention to what's on the field. What, what is your craft? 
uh, I work with the running backs group with our team. So, um, you know, in preparation, anything that I can do to help us be ready for Sundays and on game days, you know, it's all about locking in and focusing and, and that's what I'm all about. So uh, super excited to be here in DC. Can you talk to me about um, who, who, who's, um, who you're going to, who you're going to pick for, <laughs> for the running back crew? I'm just messing with you. I know you can't divulge any secrets. Um, <laughs> how have you been received? Oh, it's been fantastic. Um, you know, I worked with a lot of the coaches in Carolina when I was with the Panthers and um, coming to DC has been great. We have a great young group of guys. The coaches are great. So um, it's been awesome. You know, I haven't had any problems with anything. Uh, the guys know I'm there to help them and all they want to do is get better. And so it's been a great relationship. How does it feel to have broken uh, the glass ceiling in a, uh, NFL coaching? Uh, it feels pretty good. You know, I don't think I'll, I'll really understand the magnitude of it until maybe further down the road. But um, I definitely understand it's a big deal. And, you know, I'm happy to be the representation that I didn't have growing up. And I take it very seriously. Mm. I, I, I want to also, and, and I don't want to, you know, certainly forget medicine, particularly where we are right now. We are still in the midst of you know, of a, of a pandemic. And, you know, Dr. Bumpus, you are in a unique uh, position as, as head of pharmacology and molecular science at the School of Medicine at, at Johns Hopkins. Uh, that again is a really, really big deal, but even a bigger deal considering where we are right now in the midst of the pandemic. Talk to me about that. Yeah, so in May, when I became director of the department, I was the first Black woman to ever lead a department at Johns Hopkins Medicine to ever chair a department. So that certainly was historic. But as you mentioned, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Um, so it gave me an opportunity, though, I think, to be a voice, to show that Black people do contribute a lot to science, um, to be a voice to make sure that we're really elevating the cause of making sure that any medications we're developing will work for all people, including Black people, you know, that we're being considered. So I really think that it was an opportune time to have a platform to try to raise the, the um, visibility of Black scientists. There aren't as many of us as I'd like, but we are, we are there. And so I think that it's important to see and it's important for our voice to be there. And for younger folks to know that science is a great and fulfilling and viable option for you. Yeah, that, you know, you, you mentioned something about you know, being, you know, a black person, black woman, when you walk into a room of your colleagues, I, I'm I'm sure that there there may be other people of color there, but they may not be black people. Uh, how does it feel knowing yeah, that most you often are the not. first and only? <laughs> yeah, most often there aren't other um, black people. Luckily, my department, you know, we are more diverse, but in general, you know, I'll walk into a boardroom and I'm chairing a meeting and I might be the only non-white person in that room. Um, and I'll be one of few women in general. So it's it's interesting. Um, you know, there is a certain isolation and pressure that you feel. There's a solitude to always being the first and the only but I really take it as a sense of responsibility, as I mentioned, to make sure that my voice is heard. I feel that I'm you know, trying to be um, representative and a voice for people that have been historically marginalized in general. So trying to have that voice in science and you know, voice for all of us. But in addition, I think it is important for people to see me there and to see my competence and my love and talent for science. Um, I think that it does make them think differently about, um, you know, our capabilities and maybe rethink some stereotypes. Gosh, you, you mentioned something that, that really struck me, and, and I want to share this with some of uh, our other guests. I, I want to go back to you, Jennifer. Dr. Bumpus mentioned pressure. We know that athletes are under a tremendous amount of treasure, pressure, whether it's competing against others or themselves. How do you deal with the pressure particularly since you are a first. Yeah, it's, it's kind of weird that I don't really feel the outside pressure. You know, I think I've always put a, a lot of pressure on myself just to be great. Um, and that's something that my parents instilled in me to anything you're going to do, make sure you be great at it. And, um, you know, the pressure that I do experience is making sure our guys are the best that they can be when it's time to perform. And, you know, that's really the only pressure that I felt. Um, it's a big pressure just because winning is everything in the NFL. But, um, you know, it's a lot of pressure to make sure they're, they're ready to go on Sundays. But that's, that's pretty much the only pressure I feel. 
you know, I in watching football, you you see the coaches when things go wrong on on the field and the players come off and, and whether it's a head coach or an assistant coach and they are in each other's faces. Um, have you had chance to to be in a position where you've had to, you know, to let someone that you're coaching kind of have it after making a mistake? Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of the the calm coach. So I think after mistakes and, <laughs> and after things happen, I'm, I'm more making sure that we can focus on, on what's the next play and not dwell on what just happened. Because we'll have time to do that after the game. But I think in game, it's so important to get their mind focused on the next play and, and get over what mistake that they just made. Jaya, do you feel pressure right now? And if so, how do you deal with it? What kind of pressure do you feel? Well, I do feel pressure sometimes, but I know that I'm doing this because I want to do it. And I don't feel too pressured about anything, but um, it it doesn't really get to me that much. Mm -hmm. Live a little longer. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> I know Jackie will tell you that there is all kinds of pressure, not only the pressure of, of being an athlete, but, you know, Jackie, yeah. let, let's, let's be honest. Did you feel that you may have been carrying the weight of women and the race on your shoulders at some point? You know, I never felt that. And I can relate to what Jaya is saying, because I think that when you're in it, you're in it and you're in it to be the best. A lot of times it's the pressure outside of you, what you consider your norm. And because you train so hard, you, you, you wanna perform well, but then after it's all over, I know for me, I feel like, oh, that was the pressure they were asking me about. But when I'm in it, I'm not in a press conference like, oh yeah, I feel the pressure. <laughs> I gotta execute, I gotta get the job done. And I think that for, for Jaya, you know, you. You enjoy what you're doing. You love it. Each day you show up for practice. Now on the outside, uh, when I say the outside from like coaching perspective, is that it's a little bit tougher because it's pressure, but it's an anxiety that you want to see your players or your athletes perform well. And there's nothing you could do about it. You know you have helped them to get there, but now are they going to execute? And that kind of pressure there, I mean, is really tough because I sit on the sideline my husband coach, and we're trying to make sure our athletes are ready. I can't get out there and run for them, but Lord, I don't know. As a coach, it's tough. You know, it's tough. <laughs> Jennifer, you're, you're kind of chuckling. You want to add on, on add on to that? Yeah, she, she's absolutely right. I mean, you prepare and prepare, but once they take the, the field or, you know, that, that stage to perform, um, you have very little control, if no control, over what happens. So you just have to make sure your preparation is on point. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Bumpus, talk to me about performing. For you, it's a different kind of performing. It's not an it's not athletics, but we are talking about life or death and health and wellness do you feel the pressure to perform do you feel the weight of the race sometimes when you are the only one wherever you go i certainly feel a pressure to be excellent i mean as you mentioned i'm working on medicines my you know the things that i do in my lab influence the way that you know certain drugs are prescribed and have influenced you know the package insert the information that we get with drugs how drugs are used what we can use them for so i do feel that i have to be excellent the people that work with me i have to be an excellent coach in a way teacher and mentor to them so that they're you know doing really well um but for me i do think um i feel a sense of responsibility you know, mm. I feel like we're pushing back a little bit on the word pressure. So maybe not pressure, maybe a sense of responsibility, certainly, that I want to do well because I want to create opportunity for other people. I don't want to be the only black woman department chair of a pharmacology department in the whole U.S. very long. I want to bring other people along with me. So I think it's a sense of responsibility, I feel. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that responsibility? What does, what does that feel like uh, day to day? Are there, do you search for opportunities to be on the day in, day out work to really, to really shine and say this is, this is not just for me. This is for us. 
Yes, I do. Um, so around COVID, for instance, I love participating in community calls, whether it's Baltimore or DC where I live, having community calls just to answer questions for folks about, you know, how does the vaccine work, for instance, you know, what, how do the medications work? I really love that connection. They can see someone like them, you know, someone who's, you know, come from the same place, um, having a real conversation about the science. But in addition, I do things, I try to mentor a lot of young black women. I mean, young people in general, the young black women, I have dozens that are undergrads, graduate students in science, young faculty that I spend time with and talk to and try to encourage and, you know, let them learn from my experiences. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, have you ever taken the time to to sit back and and say, "Look at what I've done"? I mean, just in those in those quiet moments, and and if you have, what what is that like? Talk to me about that. Yeah, I think for me, it's uh, it's more of that. Look where I where I am, you know. And for some reason, that comes a lot. Um, pre-game, you know, during the national anthem, just because, you know, everyone's lined up and I don't know, you know what's about to happen. And um, yeah, I just think to myself almost every game, how thankful I am to be where I am. And also, you know, look where I, look where I am. Like I'm looking across at some of the best coaches and athletes in the world and, and I'm standing right here with them. And it's um, definitely a special moment for me. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, you have the title assistant coach. Um, when do you think at some point for you that the assistant will drop and, 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 and it can be added as, as a head coach? What, what would something like that mean, not only for Jennifer King, but the other Jennifer Kings that come behind you? Yeah, that would be a huge moment for, for women in football and women in sports and just women in general. Um, you know, whoever is first, whenever that may come. And, um, you know, I think the best way for me to be prepared for that moment is to be the best coach where I am right now. Um, and I'm a firm believer in that. And that's why, you know, I'm focused on getting better every day and um, learning as much as I can and, and to build my resume. So, um, you know, hopefully if that day comes, one day I'll be prepared. Mm, indeed. So you are definitely uh, on your way. To, to preparing for that. And again, you know, we certainly salute your achievements. Um, Jackie, as you, as you, you've looked back, you've had, you know, these great Olympic achievements, but as you move forward and, and you, and there's still time in, in sports, where do you think the next glass, glass ceiling breaking is going to be? Uh, I would say I do the multi-events called the heptathlon mm -hmm. and the women been fighting so hard to try to turn it into the decathlon and uh, and and for a while you know I was somewhat ag against it but then in my mind I was like why would I wouldn't want uh, a young girl or to have that opportunity of doing the decathlon. So, mm -hmm. and I and I think from that's on the field, but then uh, off the field is that women can be in more uh, decision-making positions where even what Jennifer is saying, I love what she was saying, because I think in order to be a great leader, you have to be a, a great follower. And to be a great assistant coach, then the eyes on you would, would know that, wow, you, you're ready to be that head coach, you know? Mm -hmm. And so in sports in general, for me, I've always just used it as a, uh, I, I would say an opportunity to do what my heart and desire was always to go back into the community of my hometown of East St. Louis and trying to inspire a generation to be the best that they can be when others said that what I was doing was impossible to do. I'm Indeed. trying to help them say the impossible is probable. Real quick, ladies, I uh, only have a few minutes left. I want to give you each 30 seconds. I'll start with you, Jaya. What is the best advice that you could give to a girl who wants to do what you're doing? Um, to not worry about what race you are or what age you are and to just focus on what you're doing and not worry about what other people are saying that could be negative and only 
focus on the positive things and focus on um, getting where you want to get to. Excellent. Well, well said. Uh, Jennifer, your best advice for um, women or girls who want to follow in your footsteps? Um, you know, learn as much as you can. Be prepared for that moment that you want. Um, make sure when you get an opportunity to live out your dream that you're ready to receive it and um, be willing to be so good at, that they can't deny you because you're a female. Mm, indeed. Uh, this is this is just a, such a great group. Uh, Jackie, your best advice for, for women or girls who are, you know, watching this and are looking for inspiration. My advice would be to always believe in yourself and never give up. And even when you think you have made it, you have to always know you have to continue to work hard. When you're looking at uh, women and girls, you know, young academics uh, who are coming up and, and looking to, to follow in your footsteps, how would you uh, advise them? What would you want to tell them about getting here from there? Yeah, I would say be who you are, exactly who you are. Don't feel or be willing to shrink yourself or diminish yourself for anybody. Um, go for what you want. You know best what you're capable of and what you want to contribute to the world. And I think importantly, don't internalize other people's opinions about what you can and can't do. They don't know you. You know you. So don't internalize it. Just go for what you want. I was going to say, you said, th those were a lot of don'ts. Can you give me a do? Do. <laughs> go for what you want. <laughs> go for what you want and be exactly. yourself. <laughs> be uh, would, would all of you ladies agree with, with being yourself, being your best self? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Be who you are. Right. And, 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 if I, and if I can in this last minute, and this is, you know, let me just say for, for this uh, young star, what would you each like to briefly say to, to Jaya? Just, uh, just, just an encouraging note, uh, Jennifer, real quick. Um, just continue to, to work hard and go for whatever you want and stay focused and, and don't listen to anyone on the outside of your circle. Jackie? Jaya? Enjoy what you're doing. Have fun. There you go. And Dr. Bumpus. You're inspiring us. You have the whole world ahead of you. You're inspiring to me. Thank you. Jaya, thank you so much. Uh, you are certainly an inspiration, you know, to me. I'm a dad girl. And so <laughs> I'm, I'm very, very proud of you. And I'm indeed proud of all of our guests who have participated in this great conversation. Uh, her story, Today's Black Women, Shattering the Glass Ceiling, make no mistake, the world is seeing what many Black girls and women have long known. For them, not even the sky is the limit. I'm Harold Fisher, good night. This program was produced by WHUT and made possible by contributions from viewers like you. For more information on this program or any other program, please visit our website at WHUT.org. Thank you. I'm getting vaccinated to be an example to my community. I'm getting vaccinated for my mom. I'm getting vaccinated because we all need to do our part. I'm getting vaccinated for my mom and dad. I'm getting vaccinated in honor of those who have lost their lives to this pandemic. During this pandemic, Howard University and Howard University Hospital have been on the front lines to support our community and the black community at large. Now you can help us by doing your part. Wear a mask, keep your social distance, wash your hands, and when your time comes, get a vaccine. The vaccines that are coming to market have proven to be safe and more than 90% effective. However, we can't get to the other side of this pandemic without you. Over the next several months, we need more than 80% of the U.S. population to take the vaccine so that it can be effective. I'm getting vaccinated for you.